the wonderful, the living legend that is Alan Moore. this in context, um, over the last just couple of weeks, uh, let me list the things that, have been, uh, that Alan's been doing in the last couple of weeks. Uh, the first issue of your uh, horror anthology, Cinema Purgatorio, has just come out. I believe so. I haven't actually seen a copy yet, but this is what I'm told. Apparently in Dave's comments, uh, Cinema Purgatorio's thing. Uh, Providence, the next issue of Providence, will be out, I think, in the next couple of weeks, and that's already being talked of as one of your major works. Um, you were at the BFI with the, the director Mitch Jenkins uh, a couple of weeks ago showing your short films, um, uh, 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 show pieces, yeah. show pieces. Um, you've been doing interviews for your uh, 650,000 world novel that's taking 10 years to write, Jerusalem, which is out in September. Uh, um, your live film of your unearthing essay is now available today that's just launched um the uh, i believe you've had meetings which means it's safe to say that there's reasons for optimism that the screenplay he wrote the show is possibly going to happen there's reasons to be optimistic i think i'm probably leaving leaving the things out the i suspect the um the bumper book of magic with you and the non-visible steve moore was well that as um there are a couple of things to finish off on that, uh, which I am leaving until after all the, the nonsense with Jerusalem is over, just so that I can really concentrate upon it. Um, yeah, I mean, probably a big thing that is, I mean, just following on from what Greg and Kermit were saying, a big thing that's occupying a lot of my time at the moment is, since we did the, uh, the counterculture event in November, uh, we, we had a, a thing up in Northampton where, and, and this was younger people, this was students. Um, they had they'd contacted me a few months before because they felt that they should be expressing themselves politically and yet they didn't really like uh, any of the options that were available. And so they'd, they'd heard that I sort of occasionally went on about anarchy and um, <laughs> that sort of stuff. So they got me up there and I realised very quickly that uh, they didn't understand a word I was saying. Um, I was making all these reference, references to people and things that uh, people of our age uh, would immediately recognise, you know. Um, I was saying, well, you know, like the, the author, uh, Aldous Huxley. Uh, and I said, but he, he wrote this great dystopian fiction, Brave New World. He was also a pioneer in psychedelics. Uh, and it was his agendas that were kind of uh, fueling the psychedelic revolution. <laughs> and so you see, this was the psychedelic revolution. It was a disciple of Huxley's called Timothy Leary. Uh, and I said, well, Timothy Lee was like part of the counterculture. And I said, yeah, yeah, actually, what, what you people really need is a counterculture. Um, not ours, because uh, that's 50 years old. Uh, you actually need your own counterculture. So, so we, we got, um, we organised this event called Under the Austerity of the Beach. And uh, we got, uh, yeah, John was up there, Robin Ince, uh, Francesca Martinez, me and Melinda, uh, Grace Petrie, Josie Long was there. It was a fantastic lineup, and everybody was just talking about counterculture. And at the end, there was uh, about 20 minutes left, so we said, what about questions and answers? Anybody got any questions? And there was this woman sitting on her own in the front row, and she said, um, yeah, can anybody tell me how I can stay here and not go home to a life where I felt that nobody had these ideas but me? And I said, yeah, actually, that's a brilliant question. Um, what about anybody who wants to take this forward in any way? Leave your addresses with the 
contact details with the gentleman over there and we'll see what happens. Uh, we, that December, we met up about 16 people, 17 people, and we decided that, yeah, we'd like to, something artistic that could respond to political matters. I suggested the name Arts Lab, although I understood that that might come with a lot of 60s baggage. There might be younger people who didn't really like that idea. So we completely wasted the first meeting um, <laughs> arguing about what we should call the group. The, the second meeting was in mid-January and it was freezing cold and about like five people turned up and I said, yeah, this is actually a bit disappointing. But on the other hand, it does enable me to stage a coup. Um, so I said, because that is kind of the way I roll. Yeah, and, and I said, that, so I'm proposing, we call this Northampton Arts Lab. Uh, and if, with, if, unless there's any other better suggestions, I'm suggesting we call this Northampton Arts Lab because it's what David Bowie would have wanted. <laughs> And, and, and they, they said, they said, are you, you really going to play that card? And I said, yes, I, yes, I am. Um, so we've got an art side back. We, we've nearly got our first issue out of the magazine. Um, we're having a, ro a, a rota of unused names for the group as titles for the magazine. Uh, the first one's called Peasants with Pens. The second one is called Indigo is Bullshit, which apparently is something that I said at well, I, I'm not really listening to what I'm saying. Um, it's just words coming out of my mouth in a certain order, you know. Uh, yeah, absolutely. This, this is just from the... This is just generated from the question and answers in an event in Northampton. Obviously, we're so thrilled to have Alan Moore here. We're obviously going to throw the mic out to you all very soon, and so hopefully you'll have great questions um, that can live up to generate the sort of thing that, that uh, the Northampton uh, version did. I'll just ask a few to start. I guess I kind of want to start talking about Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Shoot us. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you might have been asking me about Shooters Hill. Yeah, uh, yeah Jerusalem. <laughs> so. Yeah, what, what do you want to know about it, right? Well, I talk to a lot of people about Jerusalem, whether they want to or not. I sort of insist. Um, I kind of have the view that um, if, if you're alive in 2016 and you're not planning to read Alan Moore's Jerusalem, you've gone wrong. <laughs> but what else are you going to be doing? What TV? You know, what video game? When there's Alan Moore's Jerusalem? How would you persuade people who might say, I love the idea of it, I love the fact that you've written a 615,000 word book about Northampton. <laughs> I might, I might skip it. How could you make those people see sense? Well, I, I'd, I'd first correct that it, it's not 615,000 words about Northampton, it's 615,000 words about the tiny area of Northampton that I grew up in. Uh, my, my previous book, Voice of the Fire, that was all about Northampton. Uh, but I thought, that actually, that, that's far too cosmopolitan. Uh, I, I really should stick with what I know. Uh, basically, um, not everybody will like Jerusalem, uh, but I hope most people will. Uh, it's, it's a lot friendlier than you're probably expecting, especially those of you, uh, you might, those of you who read Voice of the Fire, as some of you might think of yourselves as readers, I think of you as victims. Uh, it's, it's, uh, that has got a deliberately, well, frankly, hostile, Front first chapter, um, which was all written in a made-up kind of Neolithic pidgin English, and went on for pages and pages and pages. Um, I was very proud of it, but someone someone said, "So why did you make the first chapter of your first novel uh, incomprehensible gibberish?" 
Um, and I always said, this was during an interview, you don't very often get time to think before you give your answers. I always said, to keep out scum. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of true. Um, I later found out about the concept of literary difficulty, which is a much better way of saying it. It still means to keep out scum, but sort of uh, with Jerusalem, I thought, all right, I've, I've frightened everybody already, everybody's intimidated. Why don't I make this novel like? really, really readable, or at least until you get to chapter 25, uh, which is much, much worse than the first chapter of Voice of the Fight. But by then, you'll have invested so much in the novel that you'll want to finish it, won't you? You know, you could have just refused to read the novel with Voice of the Fire. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to write a book big enough to talk about everything that I wanted to talk about. And, and there's, a, there's a, a, a major philosophy that runs through this book, which has been touched on a few times um, during the evening, uh, about the nature of time, about time as constantly eternal. I think, uh, you know, Prince said there was, no sense of there was no such thing as time because of music. Einstein said that because of mathematics. Yes. You said that because of magic. What do you mean by that? Well, it's, it's partly because this was... I was probably closer to Einstein than I was to magic um, regarding that idea. I started thinking, when I reached the age of about 50, which was like 12 years ago, I oh, know I don't look it, do I? <laughs> but um, you start, the maths adds up differently. You start thinking about life and death differently. You can no longer really credibly pretend that, well, I'm, I'm about halfway through my life. No, you're not. You're, you're 50. Um, so I thought, all right, how do I feel about death? And I started to think, look, well, you know, I'm, I think I've got a, a fairly decent attitude towards it, but how does it work? And, and I started to think about what I knew about physics, which is that every scientist since Einstein has apparently agreed that uh, we, we inhabit a space-time that has at least four dimensions. Uh, the three dimensions that we normally perceive, and a fourth, which is a spatial dimension like the others, but which we perceive as the passage of time. This is like a big, solid universe, and that our, only our minds are moving. Nothing in the universe is moving. It's solid. It's a block universe. Our minds are travelling through that, and it's a bit like, say, a projector beam playing over a strip of film. None of the individual images in that strip of film are changing or moving. But if the projector beam plays over them, then Charlie Chaplin does his funny walk, he beats the baddie, he gets the girl. There's a story, there's narrative. None of the frames have actually moved or changed. That is the way that I believe we have our lives. And also, that would mean that when we get to the end of our lives, there is no really, there's not really anywhere for our consciousness to go but back to the beginning, which is, depending on how you feel about your life, a really brilliant or a really horrifying <laughs> idea. Um, I kind of liked it because it doesn't require it's a completely secular afterlife. It doesn't require a god. You can have one if you want, but it doesn't require one. Um, and also, it means that you're not being judged by any remote authority that you might not happen to agree with. Um, if anything, you're perhaps being judged by yourself. Uh, it seems fairer, and it seems more credible. And also, I've read I think The Western Lands, uh, by William Burroughs, which I think begins with the date that the writer William Lee Seward, or something, uh, tried to write his way around death. And I've got a great regard for William Burroughs, but I thought that's an interesting project. 
I wonder if I can write my way around death. So, yeah, this, this comes as a, an actual free gift with every copy of Jerusalem uh, immortality. Uh, I, I don't think that you'll find many. Martin Amis is not offering you that. You can't give it back, though, after it. You can't give it back. How does this tie in with the sort of the very Blakean name of Jerusalem? Well, because if that's true, if that is true, then every moment is eternal. Everything is eternal. Every human being, every dog turd, every broken tail light, everything is eternal. Every brick, every ant. And this is a different way of looking at reality because it transforms reality. If the, what, half a square mile area that I grew up in, which is the, that's the, the, the area that Jerusalem concerns itself with, uh, that is in the top 2% of deprivation for the entire of the country. Um, it's always been, it used to be the whole of Northampton, uh, but that was like Saxon times, something like that. <laughs> Uh, we go back a long way. Uh, it's uh, the it has probably been the most despised area of Northampton since the Great Fire, which started in the boroughs, but there was a west wind, so it was the rest of the town that burned down. But they got renewed, and we didn't. We were just left to rot. Um, but it's not just the boroughs, obviously. That's the place where I grew up, that's the place that I know. It has got some fascinating stories embedded in it, but I'm using it as a kind of a shorthand for every um, degraded and despised area. Uh, and also, of course, since I started writing Jerusalem in 2005 or something like that, uh, we have had um, the economic collapse of 2008 which makes Jerusalem a lot more relevant. Uh, it's kind of suggesting that back when I was growing up, people from the better off areas of town used to avoid the boroughs. Uh, they told their children not to go there because you'll be robbed by drunks. Uh, it's possible you might have been, but not generally. And uh, what I'm, one of the messages of, of Jerusalem is, look, you don't have to go to the boroughs because the boroughs is coming to you. Uh, wherever you live, um, whatever class you're in. Um, we're all the lower classes now, aren't we? Yeah, very much so. That, um, to get off the, that, that philosophy probably explains, I don't know if you've seen the one tweet, the one tweet that Alan uh, has sent, which is via the Moment of More account, uh, which was essentially, uh, don't do anything you can't live with forever. If you read Jerusalem, that will, that will resonate. That, that is the thing that I'd like people to, to come away with. That uh, have a good life. Uh, I mean, when Nietzsche, uh, and, I mean, he wasn't really such a good philosopher as I am, so he, he, he got it wrong. But he was saying something very similar based upon the idea of an infinite universe. He was saying, well, if it's an infinite universe that is going to go on for an infinite amount of time, there will be an infinite number of identical planet Earths, just by mathematics, which will have you on them as well. Now, that was when we thought that the universe was infinite. It's not, it's just really, really big. And uh, so this is based upon post-Einsteinian physics. It's, uh, but one of the things that um, Nietzsche said was that, yeah, the person he says, this is the most scientific belief because whether it is true or not, if you lived your life as if it was true, you would have a better life. Um, yeah, live your life as if you're going to be living it forever. Yes, that would be a better life. Nietzsche also said that the person who puts forward this doctrine will be the most despised person in the history of humanity. <laughs> So, um, I hope that's not going to happen, but I'll, I'm prepared for it, you know. <laughs> no, I think that's Zack Snyder at the moment. 
Um, well, let's, let's go into the future then. Um, you've got this massive, massive piece of work off your shoulders. What are you planning to do uh, in the next years? Well, one of the things I'd like to do is I really do want to finish up with comics. Um, I, well, I've got a lot of other things. It's co I, I came up through the Arts Lab where we did everything. That was why the Arts Lab was fun. Um, I was interested, yeah, I did some comic strips in the Arts Lab, but I did a lot more performances and poems and pieces of prose. I've always liked doing just about everything, but the comics thing, uh, that paid off unexpectedly well, which all the time when I've been doing those comics, I've also been releasing albums, writing a couple of novels, doing performances, keeping my hand in. You know, I think we've, we've released about six or seven albums, which is more than a lot of people, a lot of well-known bands, that's more than they do in their career. Um, at this point, I think that probably I'll be finishing off Cinema Purgatorio, uh, which is great, incidentally, the fun that me and Kevin are having with that. We don't really settle in until issue three. The first two are okay, but the third one, that's, that's really, really good. And uh, they kind of get better. And there's another series that I've got about 48 pages on to do. And then me and Kevin want to do a final book of The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen that will just tie up all of the the loose threads, even the ones that you didn't know were loose threads <laughs> from uh, all of the previous books. So, when I've got that, I reckon that's about another 250 pages of comics. Um, then I should just like to do whatever takes my fancy. There's, there's the films. Uh, we just heard that there's a good chance that the feature film, the show, will be made. and. There are all sorts of things embedded in that. There's a possible television series after it. This could take years. Um, I'd like to re-engage with poetry because that is, you have to understand, one of the things that's put me off of comics is that, and this is probably an admission of kind of immaturity upon my part, but comics are like really acceptable now. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody really likes comics. They're, they're a good thing to have on your coffee table. Uh, I believe they're called graphic novels these days. But that's a lot more grown up sounding. Isn't it? I really liked comics when everybody hated them. I thought this is a brilliant medium that is being overlooked. It could be used for some fantastic things. Um, and now here we are. Uh, some comics are brilliant. So the medium is a brilliant medium. I am not convinced about the industry. Uh, it's, I would rather do things, oh, these days I would rather do things that nobody wants. Um, <laughs> look, you know, it, as you said, a part of your very, very generous uh, writer of Jerusalem, that nobody asked for this novel. Um, because it was just me. I, I wanted it to exist. So that's what art's about. It's not about what people want. It's about what I want. <laughs> it's, um, so um, I would... I like the idea of doing a literary novel, a difficult literary novel that's a bit kind of modernist because nobody wants that. Um, the film, the film is gonna be, it's not gonna be a superhero franchise, so it's gonna be something that nobody wants, you know? Um, these, these are the areas that deserve most attention. Pornography. Uh, I was thinking, look, this is an enormous genre, and it's all shit. It's sort of, um, this must be really important because it's about sex and we're frequently told sex and death, those are the two big themes. 
So why is pornography this field with absolutely no standards? Um, it's the most interesting thing to do is to find the areas of culture that are not being paid attention to. Pornography, magic, something which nobody in their right mind can possibly take seriously. That is attractive to me. Um, so, yeah, poetry. Everybody hates poetry. Uh, I haven't done any since I was, since I thought I was doing some when I was a teenager. Uh, because when you're a teenager, you think that looks like the easiest form of writing. I'm going to do some of that. Um, it's not, it's the hardest. Um, so I'm, I'm doing a couple of poems. Nothing spectacular, but I'd like to work my way up to something bigger. Yeah, I'm just going to put all that into, into context. All those things I listed that Alan was doing at the moment, uh, they were all self-generated. No one had asked for any of them. There were no sort of sequels, there were no sort of tractual obligations or things like that. They were all just things that bubbled up inside him. In the, the broader culture, you look at the biggest films of last year, um, they're obsessed with giving people what they want. Jurassic World is Jurassic Park, but for today's. Force Awakens is exactly what you want from Star Wars. None of this George Lucas being creative business. The culture is really aimed at giving people what they already want. Um, bear that in mind when you look at all Alan's work. All this, all this work that, that is the opposite of that. This, this sense of um, uh, it just comes out of him. And see which you think is more uh, valuable. I'm going to open up to questions at this point. I think. Over. Can we see some hands? Um, yes. Well, the I don't know how long my lead is, but I'm going to try and pass it to you. So, Alan, uh, well, you sort of intimated that um, you you kind of carved your own sort of culture. You've gone your own sort of ploughed your own path. Um, do you think that that was something that you wanted to do? Now, are you slightly angry that everyone else has kind of followed and caught up with you? and that's why you want to go off on a different tangent? Uh, or are you quite happy that you've kind of led a, a, a path that people have followed? They've caught up with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're trying to. Well, well uh, no, I mean, like, um, I'm, I'm not angered. Uh, I'm perhaps a lot less angry than you might suspect. Uh, it's just, if you hear me talking about corporations, I can see where you would get that impression. Um, <laughs> that actually I'm kind of lovely in, in real life. Uh, I don't think I'm, I'm angry about the way that, say, comics has worked out. Uh, I do wish that it had been... See, the way it tends to break down, I said shortly before I began to distance myself from comics that the future of comics seemed to me to be as a kind of pumpkin patch for growing franchises in um, that would have nothing to do with comics. Just, if you can create a superhero that could be made into a film, then that is a successful comic. On the other hand, you have got... Um, now, this is going to sound terribly dismissive, but it's not meant to be, but there are some autobiographical comics that are brilliant. Um, I think Eddie Campbell, is somebody who handles autobiographical material really well. Uh, the late Harvey Peacock was a genius at just taking... He was barely even writing about his own life. He was just writing about nice turns of phrase, things that he'd overheard. Um, I don't like... There's a certain... Some of these comic book, um, very personal, very intimate biographical things this is perhaps just me, but I sometimes get a hint of solipsism um, that these stories are not necessarily very interesting, but they're perhaps told in a novel way. Um, so, but I don't want to continually be saying, no, I don't like that, don't like that, don't. No, that's, uh, it's much better to sort of just move on to areas that I am genuinely excited in. Um, and, yeah, it's only natural that your interests are going to change subtly over the course of your life. I don't think it's a disappointment with comics. It's, 
although I'm not really very connected with the scene at the moment. Some, there are some writers who are wonderful, um, but not many. Uh, I, the majority of comics I, I just am not interested in, and that is not a condemnation necessarily, it's just uh, that of my interest have moved into other areas. So, no, I, I'm happy for people to do what they do, but it's just perhaps not for me anymore. Do, do we have any more hands? I'll just uh, get that microphone back. Oh, yeah, the microphone back. Yeah, we're ready. I'll go back. Uh, uh, hi, I'm fascinated by the idea of um, living life again and again. This notion. Um, but where I stopped short with it was where it's my life. And is it not everyone's life? Well, um, of course, it's everyone's life, but, but and from a magical sense, you could say that there is a sense that there is only perhaps one person here, um, but I could not define that or even explain it. Um, I think that the human life, whether yours or mine, is eternal. I think that, um, in a sense, it is communal. Um, we, we may yet, we don't know what identity is, we don't know what consciousness is, we don't know how connected we are. Um, certainly biologically, we have bits of other people in us. Uh, I, not I... just our parents, but sort of other people. Um, there is a lot more commu communality. Yes, I, and I enjoy extending the idea of responsibility to myself, if I'm going to have to do this again, to responsibility for other life. Yes. Uh, like, oh, I'm going to be that. Or, mm. Well, I mean, what, uh, I would only... Um, take responsibility for myself but uh, I that was because I come to the belief that we only have power over that which we take responsibility for and I believe that if we take responsibility for society and the world then we will ultimately affect those institutions um, but we don't. Most of us do not take responsibility for the whole world because that sounds like a bit of a tough job. Uh, I think that if we did, if we were to actually take responsibility for the entire planet and just say, yeah, this is down to me. Whether this is a world that I want to live in or not, this is down to me. I cannot depend upon anybody else to share my opinion of this. I am going to do what I can personally to make this a better world, at least in my terms. At um, least with the people I come into contact with. Or at least with the people that I come into contact with, I can make that better. Yeah. Right? If I'm not responsible for things that I can't control, but I'm responsible for this moment right now. Yeah. That seems perfectly fair. And that seems a better way to live one's life. Um, and if it's eternal, even more so. Yeah, very much so. Have you got any more hands maybe over here? There's, um, that was the first one I saw. I would be about to give you the mic. John. Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question for you. Um, I was uh, trying to uh, talk to my son last night and explain that I wasn't going to be around tonight because I was coming to see Alan Moore. And he said, who's Alan Moore? Um, and I sort of thought, well, you know, I tried to explain oh, this guy who wrote, wrote Watchmen and a lot of other sort of excellent comic series that are really sort of insightful and all of this. And he's this magician guy and he has some really crazy beliefs, but he also like, is, has a lot of insight. And I was just really struggling to explain to my son who Alan Moore is. And I was wondering if you were had to explain who is Alan Moore to a 10 year old, what would you say? Yeah. 
I'd say, listen, <laughs> ten-year-old. I'd say, you know, like the basic concept of God. <laughs> well, if you try to scale that up a bit, then um, no, I've got no idea. I mean, uh, it, 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 uh, I mean, how would you explain the basic concept of yourself? There isn't a basic concept. Oh, this is, it's, um, he's, he's a guy with, with uh, a funny, outdated, anachronistic haircut. Um, looks like a kind of haircut retrospective. Um, who just does a lot of stuff and thinks he's funny, but he isn't. You know, something like that would do. Great shoes as well. Hello. Um, <laughs> it's the right one. It's interesting. I mean, you're, I was liking your metaphor for um, the beam of consciousness playing among the still images of the film, and how that is a metaphor for how our life is. It, it occurred to me that. That metaphor would also work if you just said that our life was a comic book, even though you're trying to get away. Well, from I mean, that. I was, uh, I, I have also described it as um, like a novel. Uh, it would work for any narrative medium that sort of our minds pass through. Um, it's like a book um, is quite a good example. I, uh, when I was shooting the Cardinal and the Corpse with Ian Sinclair. We met the 60s uh, pop artist and spatter physician. Um, the, uh, oh God, his name, has, the brain cell with his name on has just died. Uh, this was, uh, it'll come to me. But um, he was talking about uh, books and time. And this was one of the roots of Jerusalem. I was in this creepy room in, I don't know, Enid Street, one of those Jack the Ripper streets down near Spitalfields. And John Latham, John Latham, uh, he, was, he was very near to death. Uh, and he was croaking his theory about books and how books represented different sorts of time. He says there is the time that it takes you to read the book, that is one sort of time. There is time as it is experienced by the characters in the book, that is another sort of time. When the book is closed, that is a third sort of time. And I thought, what is he talking about? That sounds brilliant, but I'm not sure what it means. Until I realized that when the book is closed, all of those events, all of those characters, all of those bits of narrative, they are all millimetres away from each other. They are all composed in a solid block and those stories are still kind of going on even though you're not reading them. Um, yes, it would work for anything. Um, at the moment, I'm probably preferring cinematic and literary mediums and metaphors, but uh, yeah, you make a good point. Yeah, comics would work as well. Uh, lovely. Uh, one more question. Um, where does David go towards? He's missing the Hello, Alan. Sorry, very quickly. Um, I understand that you have experienced virtual reality Oculus Rift experience, my friend Scott over here. Yeah, I yeah. just wanted to know, have you had any idea for what you might want to do with it? Uh, yeah, I have. Um, but it perhaps would need massive spoiler alerts. One of the things that I'm thinking of is that actually I got into um, a cab with Melinda and Melinda was having a conversation with a cab driver. This was years ago. They were talking about one of the chambers in Tomb Raider and I had no idea what they were talking about. But I thought, this is interesting. These, these two people have had an experience in a space that doesn't actually exist in this continuum. Um, but yet, it is a real experience, isn't it? Um, it was like what I was 
first the first thing that anyone said to me and this is this is a really clever thing that I said so I'm gonna repeat it to all of you so that you know how amusing and clever I am. They, they were talking about virtual reality and I said, like there's another kind. So, I, I didn't actually say it in quite as suave a voice as that, but, but that's true, it's all virtual reality. It's just that our headset is like our head. <laughs> and, but what that means is that if a virtual experience is therefore a real experience, then yeah, yeah, you could give yourself the adrenaline pumping experience of being you know, attacked by a load of zombies or, or whatever. Or you could presumably, what about spiritual experiences? What about these difficult to reach transcendent spaces that we hear about from the world's various religions and mystical systems? Why don't you do that with virtual reality? Why don't you see what happens? Um, because what is the difference between a real, real mystical experience and a virtual mystical experience? So this is a, a kind of pointer to some of the areas that I might be interested in getting involved in. And yeah, when I got shown the, the Oculus Rift by Scott, uh, there was this swing boat thing. Um, <laughs> I was just standing in a doorway, hanging on to the front, lurching backwards and forwards and moaning, you know, and uh, it, it's a fantastic wraparound experience and you actually feel it in your stomach, um, your body loses its sense of orientation, it is a very immersive experience, so why not do that with something spiritually enlightening? Yeah, I, th I think Facebook will talk to us if they have no idea what is what is coming. Um, I think was, if we don't get this guy's question, Kermit's going to stab us later, so that's it. <laughs> just going back to uh, comics, just quickly. Um, I'd just love to ask you about your friendship or relationship with uh, Dave Sim, the guy behind Cerebus Comics. Uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, how I heard yeah, about you uh, in the first place. Um, are you still friends? Did you inspire each other creatively? What's the relationship? Uh, no, we are definitely not still friends. Um, <laughs> Dave Sim, uh, he's a great artist. Yeah, um, and Gerhard, who did all the background, he's a great artist as well. Dave Sim, he got a bit weird. And at first I was hoping that it was all some, I think it's called Poderetzianism, where you pretend to take a position to satirise it. And I thought, yeah, all, all this stuff about there being a conspiracy of women, that, that's obviously, he's, he's a feminist who's taking a Poderetzian position, uh, yeah, and that all women are telepathic, but are keeping it from us now, apparently. <laughs> Dave Sim swears by this. It, uh, and I thought, no, that, he couldn't possibly be serious about that, this must be a joke. Then he said, yes, and I have decided that I am going to become a Christian Muslim Jew. Uh, because he said, because they're all the same God, aren't they? And I said, well, actually, not in the eyes of Christians, Muslims. No, they're not, though. No, they're, they're definitely not. Um, then I kind of cut off. Cerebus looked like it was going mad to me. Um, I'd stopped reading it long before the end. Uh, then there was a tribute book to me, uh, something they did for me 50th birthday. They asked him if they could repeat, repeat the interview we did together. Uh, he said uh, yes, but he put a little prologue in, helpfully in this tribute book to me, where he said that he believed that I was possessed by demons um, and that if only they knew the name of the demon, then they could cast it out. But then, in the Bible, doesn't it say that if you cast the demon out, there will be lots more demons? And then he starts going on about Mary Magdalene, um, because she was a woman, which made it worse. Um, she was probably possessed by devils as well. At this point, I thought, you know what, um, 
I really, I really have no further interest in the work of Dave Sim. Uh, so, yeah, that's one part of... The comics landscape is not as you might imagine. It is full of people who have chosen to spend their lives doing comics. <laughs> May, may I ask you a question, please? I'm, I'm aware that we've got we've got five or six minutes left. Okay. We live in an age which seems to have a schism between science and faith and religion. And if we cast ourselves back to the 60s and 70s and the counterculture then, we have people like Joseph Campbell and Alan Watts who were able to bridge a gap between those seemingly disparate worlds. But now we're living in an age where, in putting Rupert Sheldrake on next week, I've taken a lot of flack from people who consider themselves serious scientists. And on the other end of the spectrum, you know, you have the Richard Dawkins followers. How do you feel about this time that we live in and the schism between those two fields? I think it's interesting and I think that it is on its way to perhaps resolving itself. Um, I don't even necessarily think that there's a conflict because the main thesis in our forthcoming the Book of Magic that I'm uh, working on with the late Steve Moore, um, our basic thesis in that is that originally we define magic as any purposeful engagement with the phenomena and possibilities of consciousness. Um, we believe that when we first, about 70,000 years ago, when I believe that was the cognitive revolution, when we developed modern consciousness, modern language, uh, what must that have been like? All of a sudden, what we could do with our minds changed. We were suddenly having thoughts. Um, we were having ideas. And because we had not got a concept of consciousness, obviously they came from the gods. Um, they came from supernatural sources. Um, it seems to me that magic was a one-stop science of being. Everything was explained by magic. It was our first natural way of understanding and trying to gain some control over the universe that we were surrounded by. Over the centuries, magic has been dismantled with the beginnings of settled urban society people didn't have to grow their own food for the first time. So what they could do was specialise. You got priests who were able to specialise. That took away magic's spiritual component. You got artists and writers, those bastards. And they were able to specialise. That took away a lot of the visionary um, capacity that had previously been solely the province of magic. Um, then, but magic was still good on healing, uh, which is effectively science, and other areas of what we know today as science. It hung on to them until around about the Renaissance, when you got the development of science as we know it today, uh, empirical reasoning and all the rest, which is it's great, it's a brilliant tool for examining reality, but it is not reality itself. Um, it, is, it is great, it can talk about anything that can be repeated in a uh, laboratory. It cannot therefore talk about consciousness. Consciousness cannot be repeated in a laboratory and will therefore always be outside the province of science. If you want to deal with the contents of our heads, the thing that actually makes us, us, then you have to deal with something that isn't science, perhaps art, perhaps magic. I believe that the two are almost uh, identical. I believe that they're practically the same thing. And I, I would say that um, I know, I've completely lost my thread. Where, where were we? You were talking about the dismembering of magic. Yes, exactly. I think that with the Renaissance, um, science rose up. That took away 
science. Uh, science suddenly became a thing on itself. It was the child of magic, but like many children, was horribly embarrassed by its parent <laughs> with her, her third nipple and all of her chanting. Um, so uh, it tried to disown itself. Um, you know, I don't want anything to do with magic. Um, however, uh, the way that science is evolving these days, there are a lot of concepts in science which are every bit as ridiculous and unprovable as the science, uh, as the ideas in occultism. Um, multiple universes, for example. I mean, that is sexing angels. We are never going to be able to prove that. Um, that is an occult idea. I believe that what we could do, basically, I believe that all of our culture is the dismembered body of magic. Every element of our culture, perhaps apart from sports, I, don't, I, I think that was just the hunters showing off. But, but everything else has originated theatre. All of our culture, science, everything originates in magic. This is an example of what the alchemists referred to as the process of solvay, which is basically analysis. It's taking something apart so that you can understand it by understanding all the little pieces. You take the watch apart to figure out how it works. That is part of a two-word formula, solve et coagula. When the thing has been taken into as many parts as it can be, when you've taken it down to the last cog, coagula is putting it back together in a hopefully improved form. I think this is what is happening now. This is what is. This is what has to be happening now. We have to link up. I believe, uh, link up magic with art. That would be better for magic, and it would certainly be better for art, because magic would have a product, something beautiful that people could actually see, that happened in this dimension, and. Art would have a reason. Uh, it wouldn't be this, frankly, a lot of half-baked conceptualism where demi-ideas are sort of enshrined. They're, they're barely ideas. They're like advertising ideas. Uh, all probably through Charles Satchel. Um, that sort of... That what we we need to do is to get yeah, connect up magic with art. We then connect art with science. Um, that's already happening to a certain degree. Scientists are taking inspiration from art and vice versa. Then, and this is the most contentious thing, the final part of the program would be to link up science and politics. Let's have some evidence-based politics. Um, that would be a coagula, that would have put culture back together into a working form. That's what I think we should do. And also, form an arts lab. Do that now. Alan, thank you so much.